Right. So uh, I'm covering three chapters today, and I'm going to cover them sort of superficially, and, and John or Tan will, will dig into it more next week. Uh, this is about our, um, the R functions, um, so your R files, documentation, and namespace, and the namespace file. Uh, and, and I think really this is sort of the the central core of this book. Like you know, these are pretty much the, the, the things you really need to have your head around uh, if you're going to be writing packages. And, and it goes into things that we've already seen in action in previous weeks, but into a lot more depth. Um, it also ends up being quite vast, and so I'm I'm going to sort of gloss over a lot a few things pretty superficially. Like always, uh, stop me and. Uh, ask questions, have a discussion if you want. Uh, I'm fine with that. Let me find my, uh, where are the comments? I can't find it. Uh, there we are. So you can see if there's any chats coming up, I'll try to see them as well, but please just, just interrupt me as I'm going along. Uh, and so I sort of made this, this schematic, this cartoon to sort of represent this part of the process. Imagine, you know, here you've written a function in R. Can you can you see my mouse circling there, or am I wasting time? Okay, uh, you know, so this could be inside a, a script you're working on, or it can be something that you source, and it's loaded into the global environment. That's how you know you would work with 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 you know with R normally, quote unquote normally. Uh, here in the context of a package, you're now going to put that function into a file, and then you're going to add some Roxygen to magic to it, and, and that will do two main things. One is that it will create an RD file that is in the man directory, and that's what will in turn be used to create the, the documentation for your function uh, or for your package as a whole or for a data set if you decide to do it that way. The other thing Roxygen 2 does is that it, it puts the appropriate things into the namespace file, and, and uh, so, that's sort of what these three chapters all, all encompass. Uh, the first chapter is all about this first bit, the green, and then we're going to talk about the documentation in chapter 10 and the namespace file in, in chapter 13. So, sexism. What did I say? It was sexism. <laughs> Ask me. I was just making a bad joke because it's called the man folder. Oh, I got it. Sorry, I thought you were calling me out on. <laughs> no, I'm <laughs> like, sorry. That I wrong. <laughs> it clearly did not land. <laughs> I, I hadn't really thought about it, but that's where all the explanations of how functions work go. So it, it makes sense. It's the mansplaining folder. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay. I just want to make sure I'm, I'm not doing something dreadful. <laughs> right. So, so chapter seven. Um, Right, so you know, there's two main rules here. One is that the functions go into R scripts that are in the R directory. And the other is that you're gonna have a handful of verbs that you use a lot. Uh, and these are load all, which, which takes everything that you've put into an R script and loads it into your sort of, I guess, your, essentially your global environment that you're developing at the, as you're building the, the package. Uh, the test function that runs all the tests that you have for, for those functions and we'll cover testing later. Not, not this week, but some other week. And then the checks that goes through and checks everything and makes sure everything's being built properly. There's also a build function that you saw, if you were here last week, you saw John using liberally. Uh, that sort of does the same thing as load all, I guess, but it's a bit more complete and it, 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 it ensures some things work that the load all won't accomplish or the, um, the uh, document function that we'll talk about in a minute won't accomplish. When you're organizing your functions into files, uh, there's sort of two extremes. One is that every single function gets its own file, and the other is that all your functions get put together into one file, and, and neither is really best. Uh, somewhere in the middle, using sort of best judgment is really what you want to do. Uh, anything that's related uh, that have common definitions or helpers can go into one R file or any sort of family of, of related functions, and you've probably seen those in, as you're going through help. Uh, documentation using R, you'll see a number of functions together uh, that all are sort of related to each other. Uh, and then you can make them available as you're developing with this load all comment command that I just mentioned. Um, now for code style, they mentioned two different resources. Uh, one is the tidyverse style guide, which is pretty comprehensive and it tells you sort of what you should, what your style should look like and why it's important. 
And then they mentioned the Styler package, which I had never used before, which sort of tells you, the authors say it tells you how. Uh, I'm not sure I completely understand what they mean by that, but here's an example. You can, you can have some kind of ugly code here with all sorts of abhorrent things if you're an R coder, like the equal sign instead of the assignment operator and these spaces and things like that. And you can apply the style guide function to it and it will show you what it, what it should look like if you're being a good R programmer. They also have a suite of add-ins that you can use in our studio. Um, so for example, you can apply the styling to a, the, the, the script that you're working with at the moment or to a selected chunk of, of, of code. I honestly couldn't get that to work. I'm not sure what I was doing wrong. Um, I, I got output from my console saying, yeah, it did it, but I couldn't see anything else <laughs> from it. Uh, and I, I'm not sure uh, what my problem was. I'm, I'm almost sure it's on my end, but that was something that I struggled with. Uh, if anybody else had similar problems, I'd love to hear it because it made me feel a lot better about myself, but I'm, I'm guessing it's just me. It would it'd be interesting to try to walk through that and sort it out. I use style package all the time, but yeah. I haven't used uh, the add-ins. So I have, here's an example, right? I have this big, ugly, nasty style here. Uh, we can sort of take some of this away. This is, right? Okay, so I do the add-in. Um, I was gonna style the active file. So my feeling is that that should take what I see here and turn it into the nice style. Um, oops, sorry, let me get the bottom up on screen. And I get this output saying that it's using the style transformers, but I don't see anything changing. I'm not sure what's what's meant to happen. Would you expect it to change here in the, um, in the editor, John? I, would. I don't think anything's like technically bad right now. Like you have a lot of stuff that's inside quotes that could be cleaned up, like the equal signs, but um, That's like I, true. I think if you, I think if you removed all your spaces around your equal signs and that kind of stuff, or if you put mm. equal in line two, ugly code equals, um, it should, it if, should clean all that up. Yeah, if you took the ugly code out of quotes, basically, it would probably clean you up. And then the other thing is, if you're going to style file, you need to save before you style. Oh, is that right? Yeah. So Does, take the. Isn't that active file though? It doesn't active file not need that? Is I, I'm, like I say, I usually use. Or do the whole package at a time, but sure. Mm. Um, or I thought if I did this and then I did style, style selection, yeah, selection, and it did still. Oh, no, I've broken it. Uh, to be honest, I'm having some trouble reading it. It's um, oh, sorry, pretty small font. No, <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, that's plenty. Thanks. That is uh, um. I'm sorry That's... that we broke your console. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, huh. hmm. Maybe it's the double assignment. Ugly code yeah. it is. I don't know. Should have uh, it. But Unfortunately, it, yeah, it's, it's actually running the presentation. So <laughs> <laughs> there's no oh, stop. That... Yeah, there's no stop button. Press escape. Or enter or control C. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Huh? We broke them. <laughs> that didn't last long, did it? You could try it. As, I think you have Foo Factors as a separate session. Is that right? Yes. Behind you, yeah. That might be like if you're running the presentation out of this one, oh. you might be able to use the Foo Factors to show the style thing. Well, but mostly to try to get his cursor back. I'm wondering if there's no way. There, I was just wondering if there's some bug that it's interacting with the other session, but I don't think it's that. I don't know. No, there are processes are pretty separate. Yeah. Let's see. Huh. All right, what can I do here? <laughs> Control Shift F10. Mm -hmm. Control, yeah. I, guess uh, I, I don't know what the Mac translation is, sorry. Our studio has a built-in code styler also. There you go. Uh, Control Shift A. Yeah. That one sucks. I hate that one so much. I hate that one so much. It, like, throws everything on different lines and it doesn't like it's like very very aggressive i'm not a fan of that one okay it looks like my presentation is still okay 
still going. So that's <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, anyway, I, I struggle with it, as you can see. And <laughs> probably we should stop there before I yeah. have to restart again. <laughs> um, it seems really useful. Uh, and if you use it all the time, John, that's good to know. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what my problem is, but well, in this context, at least. Yeah, you can also set up um, GitHub actions that will just automatically apply the style to anything right. you check it in on GitHub. So Okay. That seems convenient. <laughs> Uh, okay, so then they talk about execution. This is a really important thing to get your head around if you're building packages because it can be fundamentally important for some of your code. Um, basically what it is is that with scripts, the code is executed when you run it, with the package is executed when it's built. Uh, and for a lot of code, that's not a problem, but it could be a problem for some things. And they go through a couple of examples. Um, the, 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 reason, the way to get around this is to keep everything inside functions um, and, and that you're package code should really only create functions. It shouldn't create static objects or variables. Uh, so for example, if your code had this command here to create a variable X, which is the system time, well, that would reflect the time that the package was, was built. And if you're having your, let's say you, you had your package built by CRAN, then that would show the time that CRAN built it, not the time that it's being run on the, on the user's machine, which is probably not what you want, unless for some reason you do want that. Uh, so if you had, if you just wrap this whole line into a function, then that would resolve the problem. They go into a few other examples. So uh, here's an example with system file. Well, this is going to reflect the, the, the directories on the machine where it's being built, not the where it's being run. So that, in this case, this code would run, would, would cause a problem if it was wrapped up in a package. I'm not going to go through all this other stuff in here, but you can see it a very easy workaround is just to put this whole thing into a function where you create that list in a, in a function that can be executed by the user. Uh, another example that they said is with colors. Uh, so this would be some kind of code that would look at the user's terminal and, and create code, create a, 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 a vector of colors corresponding to the user's output. And they mentioned that often, like especially on CRAN, for example, your packages are built with headless servers, which don't have a terminal. So there wouldn't be anything there that would cause a problem for the user. So uh, again, if you just wrap these inside of functions, then it will be executed by the, by the person who's running your package, not the person who, not the person who built it. And another example is with aliases. Uh, I, I never use aliases, but I guess this is one that would come up if you wanted to, to alias this function, the blah function, the B package, well, that's going to only reflect the version of B on the machine when the package is built. If, if B is updated or, if, you know, there's something wrong with B and then the next release of B now fixes a bug, your, your built code, your built package won't reflect that change. So it's much better to wrap it in a function where it will use the version of blah in package B that's on the local machine. So as, as B is updated, uh, so too will it be for the user of your of your package. Another thing they mentioned is to be respectful of the R landscape, um, and what they mean by this is is settings and and ways that R is running on a local machine that might not be reproducible in your package, but that also your package might might affect for the user. So, for example, things that modify the search path for the user you shouldn't have code like library or require in your package because uh, that's going to that's going to mess with the search path um, that the user is using similarly you shouldn't mess with the user's options or the working directory and you shouldn't source codes in your packages uh, now there are cases where you might need to do some of these things and we'll come to that in a minute um, but really the, the best best practice and the most you know polite and decent thing to do is to make sure you clean up after yourself if you do have to do those things and i'll, I'll show you some examples of that in a minute uh, here are some other hallmark functions that you should try to avoid so parameters setting the environment setting location and setting the seed um, so if you're doing any of those things as you're writing a package stop and basically is, is hadley and jenny's advice um, if you do have to change the landscape 
they have this nice package called Wither, I guess is how you say that. I don't know if anybody's used it and knows the truth. Um, I called it Wither. Uh, it's very much like on exit that those of us who went through uh, advanced R will have come to know. And this is basically a way of cleaning up after yourself after you've messed with the R landscape. So they show this example. Here's a function called sloppy. And what it does is it changes the options for the number of significant digits that are printed out. And you, you know, in this function, you can say how many digits you want, and it will now print only that number of digits for whatever you're giving to sloppy. So here we print out pi, it's got seven digits. If we sloppify pi, we only get two digits. And now if you just try to print pi again, well, the options have stayed changed. So you've made a, a you've changed the, the landscape of the user. Well, that's not cool. So uh, you can use on exit at the end of your of your function to return things to the normal state. This kind of tripped me up here that when you call this command options, you can save that into a, an object called op, a variable. Uh, that's actually what options were before you did this, so that you can then put things back to normal. For some reason, to me, that's really counterintuitive that this assignment is, is giving you what things were in the past, not what they are after performing what's on the right side of the assignment operator. But I guess that's, well, it's a convenient function for that reason. Uh, so as you can see here, you've got the seven digits with pi, you can change it to two and then go right back to pi and it's back to the way it should be. So that's a much more polite way to, to have your function run. And then in the wither package, they have an on exit like command called defer, which which does what on exit does, but it's got a bit more pretend, uh, a bit more powerful for reasons I'll show you in a minute. Uh, and uh, in this case, it does the exact same thing. It 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 returns the global op the options back to what they were before your function started screwing with them. Um, now on top of this defer function, which is sort of the, the core of wither, are all these other helper functions and they come in two flavors, the local flavor, uh, see here, and the width flavor that you'll see here. And the difference is that width is for small snippets of code, local is for a bigger chunk of code essentially. Um, let's say modifying state from, from now until the function exits. Uh, I don't really quite understand what the, why you use one and not the other. They seem pretty much synonymous to me, but um, that's again, probably my shortcoming and not, not the packages. Uh, and they, they do four main things. Uh, these are for setting our options. This is for setting uh, environment variables, changing the working directory, or setting graphics parameters. Uh, and the nice thing, you can also have a scheduled defer action if you're in the global environment. And this is really useful if you're playing with code that needs to be cleaned up on exit. Um, I guess that, that can be kind of Kind of annoying to work with if you're if you're trying to work with it in a global environment just to try to recreate what your function will do in a different context and this is a good way to to see how the on exit behavior will, will perform um they also mentioned that you should try to isolate side effects they don't really go into much detail about this um, but basically things like creating plots or printing output uh, printing output good practice is to sort of isolate those in functions that only do that thing and, and don't do other things as well to try to keep uh, side effect functions separated from other functions. And that's really all they say about that. They also mentioned these two functions onload and on attach. These are things that are run when, you're, when your package is loaded or attached. Uh, you'll often see that with display messages, for example, um, I know if you, if you attach the tidyverse, you get a whole mess of stuff being printed out that if you're like me, you pretty much ignore. Uh, and lots of other packages also have display messages. There's uh, things you can do with the options. Uh, a number of different reasons why you might have that. Uh, if you're gonna register vignette engines, John probably knows what, what that means. I don't really. Um, so. <laughs> I'll leave it to you to go into depth, depth on that later, or you can chime in now if you care to, John. I, I don't know what it does in this context, actually. I, you got me. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and their advice is that if you use onload, that you should also unload when you clean up uh, to, to just 
have good manners for your users. And their last sort of passing bit of advice is to is to really keep tabs on your package's health as you're developing it. Uh, and really all that means is that you load, document, test, and check a lot. Do that many, many times as you're building. Don't don't do a lot of build, don't do a lot of defining functions and building things up and then check at the end because any kind of small problem that you introduced early will be compounded and more, more difficult to debug. Uh, I know I, I'm not the expert on building packages. I've only done a handful, but I run load all probably every five or 10 minutes when I'm doing it. I'm not sure about other people who know more about it than me. Um, so use these tools a lot. They're there to be used and they're really handy. They also mentioned that they're going to end every chapter with some notes for for uh, for you if you're going to try to submit in CRAN. Although this is the only chapter that had CRAN notes of the three that I <laughs> worked on. Um, to be fair, the other chapters I think are still being written. Uh, they mentioned that you you should only use ASCII characters in your scripts, and that if you uh, are using um, Unicode format, you can you can sort of find that with these help these nice utility functions. Um, so you can escape the Unicode, or you can show where the non ASCII characters are. Uh, I didn't really look into this very much. Um, I know some of you guys have packages out on CRAN. Maybe this is something that's really useful to you. Um, it was sort of a sort of a side note at the end of the of the uh, of the chapter. Yeah, it's funny. I have never dealt with this at all. Until right. today. I did okay. I had some today that I was cleaning up and I was like, oh, I know how to deal with this. And I just did it because I got the um, you know, the CRAN check uh note about it. And I, right. eh, I like to make those notes clean, even if it's not going to CRAN. So I see. Um, yeah. <laughs> hmm. Right. So then moving on to chapter 10, uh documentation. So this is now the, the, the red bubble over here. Uh, we take you, now you've, you've put your function into a file. What do you do with it now? And, and how do you let Roxygen do its magic? Uh, so really what happens, the, the crux of this is that, that, that Roxygen is gonna create this RD file in the, the man directory. Um, and, and it does, and it's also going to manage your namespace and this collate field in the description file. I'm not going to talk about the description file at all. I think there's a chapter about that that we'll get to at some point. Um, but basically, Roxygen does a bunch of, of magic that that you, you put this Roxygen block at the top of your file and, and it makes sense of all that. And it makes it really easy to create the documentation and you can do a bunch of fancy stuff with it. Uh, there's sort of four, four main steps. So you add your Roxygen comments to your, your .r file. Uh, you document it with uh, the document command or, or command shift D. You look at it with a calling the help and then you just try it again. <laughs> if you didn't like what you see. Um, there is one caveat to this approach, which is that if you have document test, if you have documentation with links between pages, those won't work if you if you did just document. So you should you should build and reload using the, the command shift B uh, command instead. Uh, here's an example of, of this workflow in practice. So on the left, can you read that? It's uh, pretty small. Um, okay, well. Pretty small. Yeah, sorry. Um, I don't know if I can make, I can't really make it any bigger. Well, basically you have the, these, these oxygen comments like parameter, whoops, parameter here, parameter here. These are the X and Y parameters and what it returns and some examples. This is the .r file and I realize the purple is probably really difficult, especially for anybody's colorblind, apologies for that. But the RD file is what you get over here to sort of rearrange those tags. Is this, any, this side any easier to see for anyone? Okay, apologies for that. Uh, let's see, there's a zoom. Hmm. You can zoom in on zoom on the view option. Let's see, is it worth doing that or should I just move on? Or, no, 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 for participants, oh. I mean. Oh, right, I see what you mean. Oh, cool. Okay, uh, anyway, so you get this RD file. You shouldn't mess with this at all. This is this file isn't for you. It's for, it's for R to do its thing. 
Um, and this is sort of the intermediary. And then the next thing that happens is that this is turned into, into this documentation that I'm sure we all have seen many times before. Uh, and I thought it's always, it's kind of nice to see your, your own code and your own functions be turned into a nice pretty documentation, even, even though, you know, to be fair, I, I have absolutely no credit for that whatsoever. It's all Roxygen and Hadley that accomplishes it, but it's still nice. It makes you feel like you're accomplishing something, at least does so for me. Uh, a couple of things to note, uh, the very first line here that no one can read in purple is gonna give you this bold, this, this larger font sort of uh, title for this help. Uh, the description will be the second paragraph here and the third paragraph onwards gets dumped into this area for details down here. And you can add other headings as well that they mentioned in the chapter. Uh, the parameters get turned into this argument section. Uh, the usage is, um, I guess that's extracted from the function itself, the main function body. Uh, value comes from the return tag and then these examples are added at the end. There's a bunch of other comments and more still than these, but these are some of the some of the more more commonly used ones that they mention. Um, so the, the ones I just showed you were parameter, and then it has the name and the description that comes after it. This tells you what the inputs are for a function. The return and a description tells you what comes out of it. I think usually the best practice is to also say what kind of what kind of object, like a vector or a list or a data frame, things like that. Uh, the examples, that's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, one thing that's, that I always never really understood was this don't run header that you see sometimes ahead of those. And that's for if you want to show code that would cause an error if you did run it. So take their advice and don't run it, but it shows you things that are wrong. Uh, and you can also, uh, something I didn't know is you can have an all your examples in a separate file. And you can, so instead of including them in that R script, you can just include the path to that file. Uh, so that's probably handy, especially if you've got a, a whole ton of examples that you want. Huh. <laughs> I don't think don't run. I think don't run is also used when the example is particularly expensive. So okay. like if it takes like 20 minutes to run your code, yeah. um, it's how you use it, but don't run it when like don't run is also used for like when you run all your package build and your package test package test, it will run examples. Um, so sometimes like it'll like build, but like it'll take a super long time to build your package if it has to test that particular example. Okay. There's also a don't test um, command as well that you can include. <clears throat> I got a, an email from a Chrome reviewer in which they said I should change from don't run to don't test because they said my examples where you could run them, but they will take over five seconds. And if it takes over five seconds, they say, then you have you have to use the don't run, don't test, sorry, uh, tag. Mm. So when the crown checks run, I think it omits those maybe, or it does something different. For well, five seconds, they told me it was like the rule for an example. And two CPUs, because <laughs> I made the big mistake of using four. Oh. And so they shout at me. <laughs> It'd be nice if we could get the like um, a condensed list of all the the tags that you can use. I there's a there's a GitHub issue and there's this big thread and Hadley says to use this alias tag list and it doesn't exist and oh. uh, just be nice to have a one stop shop with all the tags you could use. Um, I would maybe guess something we can maybe something we can work on. I, I would guess by the time the second edition is finished, they will have a command in this chapter telling you how to see the list. But they just need to figure it out still. So that's something to watch. Like uh, this chapter, I definitely use as a reference still to this day, even though I've written a million uh, little Roxygen blocks. Um, because, you know, it, it's you're not going to remember every case for how you do different things in weird cases. I didn't remember the whole that you can load an example from an external file. Um, I don't know that that's useful to me, but it's intriguing. <laughs> Which of these is going to group everything together in your um, uh, on your reference page? Do you know? Uh, it's RD name, I think. Oh, yeah. yes. 
I never we'll talk more about that next week. Sure. Probably. With the example, instead of the examples, uh, like if if that file is like a like an actual like R script versus like having the examples as comments. And well, if it was, I feel like that could be advantageous. Maybe it's like easier to test. So yeah, like that's. I think you are right. And if that is true, then that's exactly why I would do it that way. Because a lot of times, you know, I want to test the examples as I'm writing them, and it's a little bit of a pain within the oxygen block. So yeah, yeah, um, that's cool. Yeah, do note that it is singular in the case yeah. of the file and plural. Right? Yeah, very nice. Uh, so yeah, here are some other commonly used um, oxygen tags. Um, the export they don't actually they don't mention that <laughs> in the chapter uh which i thought was kind of interesting because they make a big deal of it in earlier chapters and then it's all over the place in the namespace chapter oh yeah that's that's why we can i mean that's part of why we combined these it's like yeah. you have to talk about exporting functions i mean of course like they're nothing if you don't export them they're not actually in the package until you export them mm. so yeah um yeah several other things uh see also for other resources if you want to link them together as a family um i'm sure that's useful uh, you can add other aliases to the topics that go with the family and then the keyword they didn't really quite understand i guess there's a there's a predefined list of keywords they didn't say what that list was or how you how you find it but you've got to use them <laughs> the one the one that i use all the time is keywords internal um, so that I can have documentation of a function, but specifically tag that function as being not exported. It doesn't like if you leave it off and you just don't say export, it's almost exactly the same, but not quite. Okay. And so <laughs> tagging it as actually being internal makes uh, various things downstream happier. Okay. I think that's the example they mentioned in the chapter. Um, Uh, they also talk about how you can use Roxygen to co to comment uh, to document data sets, but we're going to have a whole chapter on data sets, so I'm, I'm not going to touch on that. And you can use it to uh, describe your package as a whole, and this is sort of a supplement to the vignettes. It's, um, you might have seen that if you're you know looking for the help for a certain package. There's sometimes there'll be a, a help documentation that you see in our studio. Uh, for the package, it gives a really high level description of what the package does. Um, if you're going to do that, you have to give it a value of null uh, because you're not actually exporting anything, I guess, is, is the reason. Uh, and a couple other things like that it's a doc type package and you have to give the name, things like that. So, uh, like John said, I think this chapter is good as a resource. <laughs> I don't think it's worth you know memorizing a lot of this stuff, but knowing where to find it is probably useful if you're going along. And, trying to get fancy with your documentation. Then they go into classes, generics, and methods. And I, I'm, I'm going to sort of gloss over this. Uh, it gets kind of vast, especially if, if, you, if you're not familiar with these different types of object-oriented programming in R. And I don't think this is really the time to go into that kind of detail. Um, maybe next week, that'll be something that's covered in a bit more detail. Briefly, um, generics are functions, and so you know you document them like functions. For classes, you know they're, they're not a, 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 a they're not a, a, a formal definition, so so usually you would have a constructor with them, and that's what you should document. And with methods, it sort of it depends. I guess it is, is the take home message. Um, they say for the more complicated cases, or if it includes additional arguments, is a good time to document your S three methods. Uh, if it's something like print, you probably don't need to worry about it. The example they give is predict, the predict function. And if you have different methods for, for the predict function, uh, then that's worth worth documenting. And you can see an example of that if you go through, if you go look for predict uh, different cases, like predict GLM on our studio, you'll see a different help page than you did for uh, predict LM, for example. Uh, for S4, again, the generics are functions, so you should document them as such. Um, the classes are documented by adding the Roxygen block uh, before the set class, um, sort of in this example here, I suppose, uh, and using this, this slot tag for the slots 
um, sort of the way you'd use the parameter tag in the previous example that I showed. Um, I, I don't know much about S4, so if you have questions about this, I'm not going to be the person to answer them. Um, I'm happy to open up to a discussion, but this is pretty much the limit of, of my comprehension here. Um, for methods, it's complicated. There's sort of three ways you should do it in the class, in the generic, or in its own file. Um, and I don't think it's worth going into depth on this. Um, so let's just leave it at that. And, and um, if anybody wants to talk about it, we can talk about it now. But otherwise, I'd say we move on. Seems everyone's happy. Uh, and then um, reference classes. Uh, they have these doc strings that are different than what you'd see with other with S3 or S4s. Uh, and they include, they're included in the method section for the class documentation. That's pretty much all they say about it. And, and that's all I'm gonna say about it as well. Um, so again, there's more information in chapter if you wanna dig into this. They talk about special characters in case that comes up in your documentation. So um, the at is, is escaped with another at, the percentage with the backslash, and then uh, again, the, the backslash with another backslash as well. Uh, yeah, so those are nice things to know. They also talk about this idea of self-contained documentation, and this is uh, what we mentioned, uh, I guess it was Jake, you mentioned this earlier, about how you can put lots of documentation together. Uh, one way is, is with this inherits parameters tag, and then you call a source function to bring the documentation in from another function. And that can be either within the same package or from a different package. Um, so for example, here, for this function, you might have a parameter A uh, for the foo function. Now parameter, now this function bar uses A and also uses B. So you can assign, you can, you can document B and you can just say that everything else is, is in is inherited from foo. Uh, so A will automatically be documented in the result. It would, it would look, it would be the same thing as, as this you see on the right. Um, and I guess in your help file, you'll, in, in documentation file, you'll actually see that. It'll be displayed like this with those two in a nice ordered way. So it's just a way to sort of be lazy about how you put the parameters in. Well, it's not only being lazy. I. I was not good about this at first and I'll have a whole family of functions that have shared parameters. Hmm. And if you change, like you get, you come up with a better way of describing the, one of the parameters. If you're not inheriting, you have to change it in all yeah. the functions. Um, so I'm trying to actually make myself be pretty strict about if a, if a parameter is shared, it's only defined in one place. Um, Can we talk about this though? Cause I, if you if you do a lot of inherit params, it like won't show up in the help tooltip. That's what I've been noticing. So like if you like hover near the the function you're trying to write, it like doesn't come up as a uh, like in the little the little tooltip oh, really? to help. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out like why why that is, and I guess it's an R Studio issue more than a Roxygen issue, but yeah, I haven't. Noticed. Also, if you do inherit dot params. I think a lot of folks want that to also show up in the tooltip, which it does not. I know about the dots. I thought inherit params literally like was a helper that copied the um, RD yeah, file. I was going to say, I'm pretty sure in the RD. Param to param. Exactly no, the, RD, the RD is fine. It just doesn't show up in the, the hover tooltip. The hover tooltip is built from the RD. Pretty sure. This is, this is the question. Yeah. Like, I'm pr like, yeah, like I'm pretty sure you don't have, like, yeah, like if it has an RD file, like that's the help file that our studio would read. Um, it's not using the Roxygen side of stuff because not every package is built with Roxygen as much as that sounds crazy these days. Or, so if, I write, if I write function A and then function B is like something different and then dot, 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 and then I say inherit params from function A, shouldn't it like, shouldn't all those params be in function yeah, B? I'll, I'll, we'll have to play with this and talk about it in the channel because I don't, I don't think it's possible to see what you're seeing. And so I wonder if there's a secondary cause that looks like it's because of inherent params. We're going to have to play with that. 
Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll mock something up. Yeah, you can also, um, I don't remember how to do this. I had to look it up the few times I've done it, but you can also inherit params, I think, even across packages. Um, yeah, it's, yeah. it's yeah. showing right on the screen there. Yeah. Oh, is it? Oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's just a uh, double colon. Okay. Um, and again, you know, I, I'll end up with a family of functions that, or a certain parameter that just comes up a lot, like um, which of our servers to load some data from. Um, and I'll have different packages that use that same parameter. I just wanted to find it one time. And so that's another one that I'll just inherit everywhere. <laughs> I guess this is the one that Tad that you mentioned earlier, uh, the describing. Is that right? Or... It seems to do the same thing. Yes. Yeah, that, does, that does the same thing as what I was saying earlier, I think. It's similar, very similar. Yeah, so you can use it for, I guess it's, it's good for, like what I like is for, for class, uh, different methods for classes. Um, so is this example here that they, they show, um, you know, this is your function foobar, then you can uh, give a, a, disp, a, a method, I guess what you call it. You, you, can, you can show the different methods by class with the describing uh, tag. Um, I didn't explain that very well, does that, that make sense to everybody? Um, it makes sense. Uh, Visually helps. Yeah, I, I have a question about inherent param. Sorry to, to go back. So does it just look, if you call that, it just looks at like the arguments that your function has in common with the thing you're inheriting from and then just uses all of the... Yes. Okay. So it finds the ones that are in common that you don't have a specific definition for in okay. this, you know, the certain block. Gotcha. I figured that's what it was doing. <laughs> I just wanted to be sure. That seems pretty cool, though. I didn't even know about that one. <laughs> Because there's, I, I'm the same way. There's a bunch of, especially like within a package. I, I don't mm -hmm. know about like using ones from other package, but like a lot of the functions tend to just have similar arguments. But I don't necessarily want them to be part of all one giant help page. Right. Yep. Um. Yeah. So. Oops. Uh, and then the last thing they mentioned is RG name. Uh, maybe this is something that somebody mentioned earlier. Was that you, Ten? Okay, sorry. Uh, so you can merge documentation from many objects into one file. Uh, I, I sort of stopped at that <laughs> level and, and hope that whoever is the console who takes it over next week can dig into um, this in more detail. I am going to make a note that a specific thing we should do next week is explain the difference between RD name uh, and describe in. And I say we're going to do that next week because I don't know, <laughs> like, when to use one and when to use the other. Family. When when does family come into play? That's that's okay. I'll put that in there. It's slightly different. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Right, so, okay, we're almost there. Chapter 13, namespace. Um, so you know, probably a lot of us know what the namespace is, but in case you don't, well, what does that mean? Well, it's the space for names. <laughs> and, and basically it's the way that, that your code tells R where to find the value that's associated with the name. Um, so the, a, a good example is here are the name summarize. Well, that can point to two different functions depending on which version of summarize you're you're using? If you have if you've attached libraries uh, packages in a certain order, then it will go to the most recently attached um, package. But when you're building when you're building a package, uh, it's important that you're being explicit about that, and and that's where the namespacing comes in. Uh, it also is important for well, one of the main aspects of it is that it, it defines what's imported into your package and then what's exported from your package for other people who want to use it. Um, so basically how your package finds functions from elsewhere. 
uh, and, and what it makes available for those who want to do the same in turn. Uh, in order to, to understand why this is important, it's important to understand the concept of the search path. And this is really the list of all the packages that are attached. And it starts, I guess, with base is always at the bottom and then it sort of builds up from there. And, and, and the most recently attached package is the one that is, is right neck, right beyond the global environment if you're using it, if you're using R in sort of an interactive way. And you can access that with, with search. It will tell you all the different packages that are attached. And then they mentioned that there's, there's this distinction between loading and attaching. And I didn't know the difference. I use them interchangeably. Um, but there's a difference and it's important when you think about package development, what that difference is. So uh, loading puts the package into memory. Uh, it makes the, the, uh, the components available, but you can't access them unless you access them explicitly with this double colon operator. Um, for normal, you know, sort of everyday use of R, you would probably almost never do this. Uh, however, if you're going to build packages, then you should do this. This is actually your go-to move for using other functions. In contrast, attaching is loading plus putting the package into the search path. So if you did search with a package that was attached, you'd see it. If you did it with a package that was only loaded, you wouldn't see it. Uh, and this is what you do when you use a, a library command or, or require. Um, and, and to define it when, you're, when you're building a package, the things that are attached would go under the depends header in the description file. The things that are only loaded would go into the imports header in the dis description file. Uh, and, and Jenny and Hadley's advice is to, to use this, to, to import in the description file and then explicitly call the function with the double colon operator. Uh, so when you think about the namespace file, uh, it's basically just a text file, but every, every line is called a directive and it, it describes an R object and there's four different types. There's four for the imports and four for the exports. And these are things like export or S3, I think is one of them. Um, there's maybe methods is another one. Um, yeah, S3 method, uh, import from a couple of the things that I didn't, don't, don't, I'm not going to get into and didn't really understand, to be fair. Uh, and you use Roxygen 2 to generate this namespace file. So just like the RD files, you shouldn't touch it yourself. You should let Roxygen do its thing and, and, and create it for you. Uh, the workflow is sort of similar to what we saw before. You put your comments into an R file. You document that to convert it to an RD file. And then you look in the namespace and make sure that the specification, specification is correct and that it's working. Uh, for exporting, what they say is that it's a good practice, but basically export less if you're ever in doubt. Um, and exporting is basically what you're allowing your package to make available to other users that they want to use your, your package and their own packages, I guess. Uh, sort of, you know, what's available in the environment if they were to, to attach your package, what functions would be available in the, glo in the global environment. Um, these are created with the export, the export in the oxygen block. Uh, there's, they go into some detail about how you do that for S3, S4, and RC classes, uh, objects. Um, and I'm not going to go into that now because we're getting thin on time and um, it gets there's quite a bit of detail there. Uh, for the imports, uh, the namespace controls where, uh, which external functions can be used by your package uh, without having to use the double colon operator, but they say, you know, unless there's a good reason to, don't do it that way. Uh, instead, use the description file to, to say what's going to be imported. And then they, they Say it's confusing because you have you've got the imports field of the description file and you've got something else which is in the namespace file and those seem to do the same thing but they're different. Uh, how do you make sense of it? They don't really talk to each other necessarily. You, know, you might have something in the imports field of the description that doesn't appear in the namespace file at all and that's kind of confusing. Uh, so their advice, like I mentioned before, is to put it in the description file so it's installed and refer to it explicitly. Um, and there's a number of reasons why that's good, um, not least of which is that it's very clear where you're getting the function that you're using from, uh, if you want to look at the, doc at the documentation later. 
uh, if you want to import, import uh, a particular function explicitly, you can, you can uh, use the import from command in the description uh, with the package and the function name. So if you just want to do one function, for example, instead of the entire package, you could do it that way. Uh, and that's really nice for operators. So for example, if you want the pipe operator, I think is it use this has its own command for pipe, use pipe. Is that part of use yep. this, I think? Yeah. I use that all the time when I'm, <laughs> when I'm building because I, I, I'm useless without the pipe operator these days. <laughs> Me too. Uh, Again, they go into a bit more detail about uh, the S3 generics, how you import them. Uh, basically, for S3 generics, if you import them like regular functions, then the method should come along with them and they should all be available. Uh, with S4, it's a bit more complicated, and I'm not sure they even touch RC when it comes to imports. Um, and that's that's it for me. That's as far as I got. It's pretty much the end of the namespace chapter. Uh, I did gloss over a lot of stuff here in the namespace. It gets um, it is important that you understand it. Uh, it does go into quite a lot of detail, so it's probably good to to really dig into it and and, and learn it better at some point. I'm not sure what we're going to talk about next week, but that's probably something worth focusing on. I will say that the namespace is one where. Like it's good to read the chapter and kind of understand how it works, but the actual namespace file, like I never ever touch that. Like if something's acting weird, sometimes I'll delete it and let Roxygen recreate it. Mm. Um, because Roxygen will recreate it from scratch if it's not there when you document. Um, it's not something that you are likely to ever need to manually edit. And if you do mean, need to manually edit it, you're doing something weird and maybe <laughs> look into how <laughs> an easier stop. way to do that. <laughs> yeah. I like looking at it to like debug, like why doesn't this function exist? Usually it's because I did the export weird on a method or something. Um, so basically if it's in the namespace file and it's loaded, that function should exist when you call it. Right. Um, and sometimes it's not. So sometimes I'll get error messages like, you know, this function is whatever. And if it's not in your namespace, go look for it, right? Like that's one of like my like debugging points with namespaces is to be like, okay, so it has a method. Like, you know, like sometimes I'll write a method. Does this method exist? You know, did it document properly when I run, ran document? Well, go to namespace, look for the method that you made and that you're looking for the difference on and see if it's there. If it's there, should exist and it should be called when you call <laughs> the generic. Um, otherwise, like you know, the separation point is the namespace is weird. <laughs> I think that's a worthwhile just thing to know what you're looking at rather than doing anything with it. Don't touch it. Mm -hmm. Or alternatively delete the whole thing and then get Roxygen to rebuild the whole thing. But you know, same idea. I like just deleting it all and just <laughs> letting Roxygen do it. Classic. Yeah. Uh, once in a while, something will happen. I mean, I guess basically someone will edit it and then Roxygen can't deal with it. It's like, I don't know what's going on here. And literally, like, the, the way to solve that is just delete it and then you'll, everything will be fine. One thing I didn't mention here that I thought was kind of handy was the the missing S3 command from DevTools that tells you if you've got S3 methods that you haven't uh, exported. Huh. I feel like if I if I I, I would like again with it like I I don't notice that it's missing until something is broken and it's not working. Mm. So like, it's not something that like, it's it's cool, but I don't notice that it's a problem till much later in my like revising path. Yeah, but it, what occurred to me is like, I, I was doing what you were just describing where I was looking at the namespace file to see, you know, everything that I that I defined, is it showing up there? And there were things that weren't, these methods that I had written. I was like, well, that's weird. And so if I, you know, I ran that command and I said, oh yeah, you haven't documented those or whatever it tells you for the output. Right. So, you know, in that way, the namespace helped me to realize what I had not done properly. 
I think there's something interesting to talk about in, at the um, all, at the loading versus attaching slide. Um, just that, like, if you write something on load, it will be accessed. Like it runs whenever you load the package. So whenever anyone runs the uh, something with the dot dot part, it will literally run any on load stuff if it hasn't already been loaded. Um, whereas anything that you put into like an on attach function um, get happens only when you library or require it, right? So this is something like, um, you know, I've been working on stuff to try to like mem memoize it and make it faster. You want that in on load because you want it to be memoized when you load the package. You don't want it to be done at build time. You don't want it to be done only when it's library. You want it to be done whenever somebody does anything that touches that package, like before anything happens, memoize this function so that it's mm -hmm. tracking the history of that function and so on. So it's interesting just thinking about it. I, I had never thought about it before this until um, until you write something that's like, do this when the package starts is like, that's when I like started really understanding load versus attach and specifically memoizing, which is what's supposed to be done on load. Mm -hmm. For maximum speed. Well, good. Anything else we should discuss, or are we all <laughs> happy? Um, I will just point out that when I was writing, like learning objectives, especially for the name namespace chapter it's all like recognize, like you're, you're not supposed to learn anything that's in the namespace chapter or hardly anything. It's mm -hmm. all just like, get a, get a feel for it and be able to look it up if something weird's happening or again, just delete namespace and redocument. And then most of the time, everything will be fixed. Um, but things like the difference between on load and on attach, like that is useful stuff that's in that, in the chapter. So those are nice to know, but a lot of it is uh, information that you probably will never use. Like I, you know, I don't ever write export, export pattern, export classes, whatever. Like those, Roxygen does those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, for me, it's definitely a, re, a, a reference, and not something I'm going to internalize. Yeah, most of the stuff. <laughs> I mean, my, my, my copy of the first edition is all bent backwards with pages <laughs> folded over and post-it notes stuck in it in different places. That how much how much of a, the second version do you think is different? Because I remember I read like the first version like, I don't know, like two years ago. And now I'm re like reading this material and I think a lot of it's, well, I don't know. It's like, I felt like with advanced R, I think there was like a lot more that was um, the same from version one to version two, but. I don't know, like here, I think is, there's still some like, uh, you know, holdover, but like, you know, with the chapter six was like completely different. Yeah. So the first section was it the first seven chapters, eight chapters, something like that. They've pretty much finished the rewrite. And in doing that, they did change quite a bit. Like they added chapters. Um, they're moving things around a fair amount. And we are now pretty much completely ahead of them. So, you know, sorry, <laughs> but I still think it's going to be really worthwhile. Um, Tan and I are trying to kind of like follow their GitHub and watch what's what changes are coming so we can kind of talk about them. Um, so I think part of the reason, you know, you might not see like, oh, the um, documentation chapter still is missing some of those things that I wish were there. Well, that's because they're not done yet. In fact, I don't think, yeah, it looks like they haven't started that one yet. So if you look in the GitHub, they're doing this thing where they capitalize the chapters that are updated. So you can look at it, all the lowercase chapters are not revised yet. And the uppercase chapters are revised. Um, it's a little, not exactly that because there's the new licensing chapter that is lowercase, but I think Hadley did that because only he has touched it. I think Jenny comes through and capitalizes when she touches them. Um, 
but yeah, so you can kind of look at it and go, oh, you know, this man chapter is uh, lowercase. The namespace chapter is lowercase. Um, but the code chapter is uppercase. So that one's updated. 